Beltrami. We're here at my studio talking about music and movies. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little TV. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, Marco, thank you so much for, for sitting down today. I really appreciate it. I'm such a huge fan of your music, so it's such a great honor to, to chat with you about your career oh, and, thank you. and everything. <laughs> um, so to, to kick things off, I would love to kind of talk about your background and um, uh, kind of what was your earliest memory of kind of finding music and then how did that kind of push you on the track to becoming a, a visual you know, media composer? Um, well, my, my dad was really into listening to music, like more classical music, a little bit of jazz. Uh, when I got older, more jazz stuff. But um, uh, for Christmas, I, I would get like a... Um, like a Beethoven symphony or whatever, and a, and a score to go mm -hmm. with it. Um, I studied piano from when I was young, you know, pretty little. So, um, uh, I mean, I it was it was cool because I would sort of learn how to read the scores and uh, go through it, and uh, again, a um, appreciation for music early on. I think right. just sort of you know through home. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I never really thought about scoring for film. I, there was, I, I didn't go see a lot of movies when I was young. I mm -hmm. wasn't, I don't know, I wasn't allowed to, uh, <laughs> for some reason. And I, and movies, I remember being scared by Dumbo, the elephant, like seeing that, like. Well, that's a dark movie. <laughs> yeah. So, so. Still scared. It's still scared. Yeah. So, um. <laughs> Uh, but one movie that did have a, a, a big impact on me was Fantasia, and I yeah. remember seeing that like maybe six or seven times. Um, That's the first movie that my mom ever showed me. Really? Yeah, and she says, even before I was even got to speak, if I needed to be quiet, she just put Fantasia on, and I would just watch it. Shut up so, and watch. So maybe that has something wow. to do with how I got into the visual media and music, and the music and image, like yeah. the, the combining of that. Yeah, too. it's very interesting, because it uh, definitely has things from a childhood like that yeah. definitely have an impact and I you know I'm sure I didn't realize it then if, and, and who knows if it did or not right but, yeah um, but somehow uh well I mean when I went to undergraduate school I went to Brown University I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't study music I, I what was your degree Are you... well I started out my parents wanted me to do something in the sciences I started out in geology oh wow um but it didn't it didn't go well after two years. They were like, "You should think about doing something else." You right. Can't, you can't tell one rock from another rock. <laughs> so um, then I switched to uh, urban planning, urban studies oh, wow. there. And um, uh, but you know, all along I was working on music myself, uh, writing pieces, getting some performances, doing things. Um, again, no media stuff, just yeah. music and. Um, and then after that, I went to Yale School of Music to get a master's degree. I knew I wanted to pursue music then. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of where I really buckled down to get, you know, all the technical stuff together. Um, and then I had to make a decision what I want to do. Either you teach and stay in academia and yeah, sort of, yeah. you know, um, but it seemed kind of crazy to me to go to school just so that you could teach other people right. you know, like without any just take what you learn and just read yeah because it has no out. real world you know it's yeah. sort of in a vacuum working yeah. you know uh so i didn't know much else what i could do i um my my teacher at the time was friends with jerry goldsmith even though they came from very different worlds mm -hmm. um and um, told me about this program at USC and um, I applied and uh, I, I, I came out here uh, from I'm from Long Island New mm -hmm. York and um, did the program really enjoyed it I met some cool people I thought yeah you know, I mean well, nerdy, nerdy people but yeah. you know people that were that were interesting to me and um, um, we had a good class Chris Beck was in my class oh nice 
um, <laughs> some other people. Um, anyway, the, um, uh, the, the more I learned about it, the, the more I thought it really has a lot of opportunity. I mean, the things I was into at the time were really sort of exploring um, timbres and extended techniques of the, the orchestral instruments and the yeah. musical instruments. And then uh, little by little, I began to see that you can sort of take that same principle electronically and work with... Um, uh, you know, acoustical sources, but yeah. sort of manipulate them and all. Um, and and the cool thing about film is that you just sort of working for a singular performance. It's not right, something yeah. you have to repeat. Like, um, and and that was that was cool. So I decided to stay after USC, and uh, actually Chris and I teamed up together for about a year we worked together we did a show called land's end right. um <laughs> and uh a couple other things uh we did a a show about why airplanes crash and ever since that i'm afraid to fly uh, <laughs> um and uh and you know it's just sort of just i don't know of... we did some tv shows and uh, you, Scream was sort of the first movie that I that I did. I I'd done some movies the week and all, but yeah. that was sort of a unique uh, time because Wes Craven uh, wanted someone uh, to do his movie. It was a low budget movie. How did how did you get on that project? I mean, had, had Wes had already have a career, you know, yeah. as this kind of horror auteur. And, yeah, uh, how but he guys... he was looking for something different. I um, I mean, he, he had a uh, an assistant that mm -hmm. I I had just finished a uh, a short movie from a USC student. Yeah, and that USC student knew West's assistant and mentioned, oh, you know, he just did a really good job on this, and so she called and said, you know, maybe maybe we can meet and um, uh, come in and talk to Wes and see and because he was I guess he was having a hard time finding anybody I don't know hmm. I I mean that's a good question I never asked him why didn't, why, why yeah. didn't he pick you yeah I, um, but um, I met with him and uh, he showed me a few scenes and um, I, I don't know I mean Besides Dumbo, that was like the first. <laughs> it was like the, the, it was, I had never seen a horror movie, you know. I'd yeah. never seen any because just because I'm like. Uh, Cause you, I, weren't I, a, you weren't a movie buff, right? You weren't. Yeah, well, uh, well, uh, I, I, a scary movie buff. There, there yeah. were other movies. I, I actually, I, I could backtrack a little bit about yeah. um, things that got me into why I was interested in film scoring, but um, um, at that point, yeah. So. I, I think, and then he gave me a chunk of the movie, the opening. It was like uh, maybe 12 minutes, 12 or 13 minutes, where right. that scene where Drew Barrymore gets killed in the very beginning of the movie. Yeah, the famous scene, yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> said, um, why don't you, I, I don't know, you were, I, I really like what you have on your tape, or send a cassette tape yeah, to yeah. him. <laughs> um, but why don't you try scoring the beginning of the movie and see, and I... I said, okay, I, this scene was terrifying to me. I, I think the um, the thing that he liked was that I was completely not jaded, you know? I, yeah. I, I didn't have any reference. I didn't know horror scores. I didn't know horror movies. And so I approached it really naively. So what was um, your kind of approach for that scene? Like, what were you just going from your gut instinct of, like, this is what shocks me, and then you try to just translate that into music, or yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, basically, like, um, and however that materialized, it, it resonated with him. Um, I brought him back the the music uh, two days later, and um, he really liked it. And, wow. and they had a screening for Weinstein uh, for Miramax in. Um, New Jersey, I think, like a couple of days later, and mm -hmm. he, he had that in, tested really well, and he said, all right, look, why don't you, we'll 
Let's try it. Let's come out and do the score. And was it a daunting was, thing when that happened? It was really daunting. Yeah. I was very excited, but it was daunting too. Yeah. You know? um, but but I realized it was a, a, a big opportunity for me. And, and then it materialized into the whole franchise. And it did, yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, let's, 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 let's focus on screen for a little bit. So how did the, you know... Horror movies are known for you know being a sequel, and it was a self you know it was a horror, in a, in tongue in cheek horror where it was very aware of being a horror movie. So yeah. and that in itself was really fresh and original at the, yeah. you know, at the time. And so how did the music evolve? I guess from and, and it could sort of I guess it could sort of play a little bit over the top in yeah. that, in that sense. And um, so you know a lot of the things that I was familiar with, like playing with orchestral timbres and um you know because it was for the most part a fairly orchestral score there was yeah, some yeah. some um electronics in it but fairly minimal pretty stock stuff and uh i i remember we had fun because i didn't have enough players i had this thing i wanted there's a few scenes i wanted to make this kind of creepy atmosphere and i thought it'd be cool to have um sound of a whole bunch of people whistling together make this cluster and mm -hmm. so we didn't of course we didn't have enough people so I, <laughs> so wes assembled his whole crew and and so that, and i wish i had a picture of it because so we have this on the scoring stage of warner brothers we have wes and his producers and the post-production supervisor and everybody's standing there out there with the orchestra and you know and i'm conducting they're all whistling and and it was it was really cool it's fun <laughs> Um, in this, in the second film, there's one thing that, um, and we can talk maybe about temp music now because what, was, what the most striking temp was how Broken Arrow came into Scream Two, and yeah. it kind of became their theme for uh, for Courtney Cox. And and yeah. so as a composer, how do you deal with that when when that, that... so that was like really disturbing to me. I mean, yeah. this is my second movie. I I I, th I felt very uh, like this is my. You know, thing. Yeah. I, I was very possessive about it, um, and uh, you know, it was it was really detrimental f uh, at the time because I remember John Burlingame did a he I, I don't know he was doing a uh, article in the paper in the Sunday Times about um, temp scores yeah. and all that. And this was on his radar. Yeah. And he um, decided he would interview me about it. And I just uh, stupidly, naively, I, the, yeah. I, I said, you know, like, I started, you know, how could the production do this? I was like going on the soapbox <laughs> about, about, about it. And, 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 and he published all this stuff. And the, like, I remember the next day, the, um, one of the producers called and said, what the fuck? What are you, you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> this is like our own internal laundry, and you're like, you're, yeah. you know, just because you're upset because we use this uh, piece from another movie. Yeah. And well, that was a I didn't know what yeah. to say, and she, and she was like, you know what? You're you're not working for us again. That's oh, wow. it. You're done. And I'm going to tell Weinstein not to use you again. Oh and I was God. like, oh shit! I just <laughs> screwed my career. <laughs> so so um, then I learned, you know, just learned your lesson. You know, shut up. yeah, just shut up. Um, but it was um, it was op eye opening for a few reasons. One is that you know you you're hired to do your best and write yeah, the score that sure. you can and all that, but then you sort of have to let it go. Yeah. Because and, yeah, how do you yeah compared to now that was you know kind of early in your career and, and of course it still goes on every composer deals with it yeah all and, the time and all so, the time and how has it changed now when you do yeah. temp temp music that has to I mean it's, it it happens every now and then that yeah. you know I'll write something and they'll be like this temp really we really like the temp here it's mm -hmm. very it's not that common anymore but um, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it's that. actually harder now, like when it's temp with my own music, because then, because sometimes it's harder. Like if, it's easier for me to to hear a temp and see what that piece is doing. Yeah, yeah. And then do something new. Then sometimes if it's a piece that I've done that's in the temp, to try to get that feeling, I, I find that you find I don't know, I, that I'm sort of rewriting the same piece. Right. Yeah. And and then it's like. It's hard to get out of that rut. It's like yeah. you know, when your tires in a rut. So, um, 
Yeah. So I'm, but it doesn't bother me. You know, right. um, it's 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 a business. The the, the thing is, um, we're sort of all in it together. You know, the director sure. and the, the writer and the, the composer and all the people. It's a collaborative business, and yeah. you have to sort of look at the big picture. And and our job is to sort of help. Uh, the story and, yeah, yeah you know and so if something you have to be objective about it think, yeah for sure so you know with scream and scream 2 and the, and the these kind of they became really big hits and as a early kind of young composer getting your career started um was it did you make a conscious decision to try not to get typecast as a horror guy i mean i just thought it was odd that here i am i hate horror movies and all i'm doing <laughs> is horror movies you know we did yeah. scream movies then um, Halloween H2O, I think there was. Right. And, um, a lot for Dimension Films, which was the newly opened sort doing, of horror branch yeah, of Miramax. Doing, yeah. uh, Mimic and yeah, um, uh, Nightwatch and um, I have all these movies. Um. Did you feel but, trapped in there and trapped well, in the genre? A, a little bit. I, I, mm -hmm. I wasn't too worried about it. I mean, maybe, I, maybe just because we were so busy like uh, it didn't have much time to think about it yeah, but yeah. um but um i i yeah i mean i felt like i have uh, other things other things to, to say yeah did you get um i mean we're, it must have been challenging to try to what i did was i i so um and it's hard for me to remember all this now oh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> but um i remember taking some smaller uh, things TV I did a TV show for Oprah Winfrey um, at, around the same time which was like a, a drama between some kids like mm -hmm. in this ward called David and Lisa yeah 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 um, and you know, I, I, I thought something like that might show a different side uh, do something a little bit different um, there were some other projects uh, that were a little bit different um, no, you did. You started to kind of try to branch out. I and, did try to branch out a little yeah. bit, and uh, I think it. I think it worked a little bit. I, um, yeah, for but, sure. Uh, but yeah. I, mean, did, I mean, you did some awesome horror work. I mean, I think Fac Faculty was also really cool with yeah. Robert Rodriguez. Yeah, but in some stuff, you know, sort of um, like it, it wasn't just pure horror. Like yeah. Guillermo del Toro's stuff, like Mimic and Hellboy. I mean, there were so many different facets to it that, um, I, you know, creatively they were yeah. really exciting course, to work yeah, on. And he's, his, I mean, he's such a visual director too. So yeah. I mean, the the work itself was, must have been just captivating as a story. A totally storyteller. Totally. Yeah, so sure. it, it, so I didn't feel like um, like it was creatively inhibiting. Or, no. Not no. rewarding or anything. No. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were fun. You did mention Halloween H2O. And what was um, the story on there? Because I think you're listed as like uncredited or anything. Did, was, did John Ottman come to replace your score? Were you replaced on the film? Or was it... You no, it was sort of the opposite. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I, they had a score. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was sort of... Um, you know, it's odd, but it's, it's sort of weird when, you know, because you understand someone else writing a score. And yeah, then, and you have to be brought Yeah, and I was thinking, I, here, I, here I was making such a big deal about, you know, the scream, and then, <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I, they, they had a lot of temp, um, right. I think from scream movies in, oh, okay, yeah. in that, and, uh, for whatever reason, you know, they had some issues with the score that existed, and so um, they asked me to replace yeah, it. Yeah, some work on it. And another interesting collaboration, or I guess maybe not a collaboration, was Resident Evil, because you... Oh, yeah. So you did the score for that, and Marilyn Manson did some stuff. I mean, did you guys work together at all, or was it just like, oh, let's bring in Marilyn or bring you no, in? No, we, we did. Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah, uh, it's funny. Um, we would meet... Uh, Usually at my studio, sometimes at his place, uh -huh. um, a few times uh, with the director and play through cues and talk about ideas and even share some sounds. And he, it was fun. Um, it was a lot of fun. Then we recorded at Capitol for it. Um, the uh, and I remember 
because we were in, I was my studio, my house was in Pacific Palisades, mm -hmm. and it's like a really conservative street. And <laughs> um, one of my, one of the neighbors, um, this conservative woman, you know, with kids and all that, and and she she was like a big Manson fan, uh -huh. and. Um, you know, I don't know. My wife probably told her that, that he was over. We were working. So he's leaving to get this car and leave. She comes running down the street and rips open her shirt. And she's like, and he, and, and, uh, he was like, like full flash? Yeah. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah. And he's like, what's with your neighborhood, Marco? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, That's what's with your neighborhood. That was, that was wacky. But anyway, um, yeah, that was that was fun. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I really liked his approach to um, the uh, to the score. Yeah, that and was, sound it was pretty and cool. Had a, has a really good sense of um, of sound and uh, you know how it works with the picture. Right, for sure. That. Yeah, for sure. Um, you mentioned Guillermo del Toro earlier, and you're doing um, kind of Blade Two, which was you know has always been considered such an amazing film, and then Hellboy. Um, Blade Two kind of. Definitely was. Uh, I remember we studied that in film school for action editing, and I mean, mm -hmm. when you're scoring something that's really kind of you know, very precisely edited and everything, um, did you come in early on that film? Did you come in late? Was it? Or did you already have a cut good to go on that one? Or um, there was a cut. I know they were made, they were in the process of editing and making some changes and mm -hmm. all, but um, yeah, uh, boy, I I don't remember the state of the film exactly when I came on board. Yeah. Um, but when you're when you're scoring action is I mean do you have a different approach to scoring action than you would to um, to drama where it's maybe more focused on character uh, emotions or anything where it's just kind of the visual kind of kinetic motion on screen? I mean does that Yeah, they definitely the you... did affect and there were some long action sequences yeah, in, yeah. in Blade. Um, I uh, I don't remember exactly my my thought process, thought process at the time. Far yeah. in the back. <laughs> yeah, but, but it was um, it, again. It was it was another rewarding film to do creatively because yeah. it, it could had a lot of different influences on it, and uh, I really started working with Buck, uh, my partner. Now, for, I mean, he's been with me since um, back to. Yeah, let's Scream, talk about Buck Scream because Buck two. is amazing. So how did you meet yeah. Buck and how did that kind of collaborative team form? So I met Buck when, um, uh, after I did Land's End, um, he, there was a store in West L.A. called Laser Blazer. Mm -hmm. um, and the guy that ran that store, uh, wanted to, he asked if he could put out a promo album for, for, um, for Land's End. Mm -hmm. And... I said sure, and Buck was a friend of his, and he asked me. He said, "Can you know my friend come to the scoring session of Scream?" And I said sure. So Buck showed up there. I met him, and he said, "Do you have an assistant?" Do you? And I said, "No, I work alone." He said, um, "I'd be curious to come by the studio sometime." And I was like, "All right, sure, whatever." <laughs> And and he he came by the studio was you know bedroom in my house and um, in my apartment and um, uh, I don't know I, was it I like, have to ask Buck how exactly a, what you, happened you, but was it a click like did you guys just mentally were able to like work together or did, well did it kind of so over time? it started out I think I had him maybe Xeroxing some score or something and then <laughs> um, uh, I was working on a cue and he came in, it must have been on Mimic, and um, I was having trouble with it, and I, I, I played it, I said, here, let me play this, and so I played it for him, and, you know, he wasn't like, oh, that's really good, or anything <laughs> like that, he was like, well, um, this part's cool, maybe try this, he, he gave me some, some ideas, and I was yeah. like, wow, that actually makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. and uh, I tried working with what he'd said, and, um, and it worked out well, and I remember playing it for Guillermo, and Guillermo liked it a lot, and I was like, all right, so he's got a good sense, so I started asking him more and more about stuff, and 
then um, he started. Um, I, I need. I'm, I'm not that technical of a person. Yeah. So I started asking him to figure out, like, start sampling things mm -hmm. and doing all that. And so he started getting really into the technical side of um, of everything. And we just sort of, you know, just grew from uh, there. Yeah, I grew from there. I, you know, just really grew to um, sort of trust. Yeah. Him, you know, and, yeah, and you uh, guys have done such amazing work. Like, I mean, her locker is amazing. I mean, every score he's been yeah. part of yours, and whether he's co-composing or just working. Yes, yeah, like so exactly. Some sounds. of them, some of them, they're they're co-composed. Some, it, it depends on his role. Some he's creating sounds. Yeah. Some he says, uh, "Leave me off this one." <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but uh, no, it's um, it's a it's a great partnership for sure. So yeah, we're just um, going back to kind of some of the movies you were scoring. Um, you know, you, you you did Scream, which was a, a series, um, but then you kind of ju you jumped into these kind of big franchises like Terminator and Die Hard. And I'm kind of curious as a composer who <clears throat> jumping into Terminator, you know, with Brad Fidel's score and just how iconic the dun 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 is, or Michael came and stuff on Die Hard. And I just love the way you approached it, where it felt natural like it didn't feel mm -hmm. like a i don't know like a cheap hack copy off score or something like that but i mean what was your kind of approach for or do you have an approach for jumping into such a, like a franchise like that i i was never aware of how many people are, are like it was my first awareness of like there's an outside world of fans <laughs> because when i got hired there was <clears throat> i got so much hate mail from <laughs> from fans on uh, Terminator? Terminator, yeah, yeah, like, and I was like, wow, this is, it's like kind of vicious, I, and like, everyone has my email, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so, how does everyone have <laughs> email? Oh, God, so, um, yeah, um, but the the directive on, on that was, you know, Jonathan Mostow, the director, he didn't want, he wanted to make an original movie and he didn't want to reference mm -hmm. the theme. He's, you know, just at the very end, like in the end, when it goes to the right. end credits. But, um, and I said, sure, you know, that, that's it's fine. I, you know, do something something different. Um, uh, and I think the same was true on Die Hard. They didn't want it to... Yeah, I, remember, I vaguely remember with Live Free or Die Hard, just vague... Came in references. Yeah, so too much. Well, it's not really <clears throat> thematic. It's more motivic. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it was easy to just throw it in here and there, but not. Um, they didn't want it to sound like a uh, homage. They didn't want mm. it to be dated or anything like right. that. You know, which would be fun. It'd be fun to do that, but yeah. um, it, they, um, you know, understandably wanted to keep it more modern. I guess. Right, and. Um, you know, you've dabbled in some kind of more modern retakes on films like The Thing, um, which was, I think, technically a prequel, but um, based on the kind of sequels and stuff you've done, is it, would you say it's easier to score a remake or a sequel? Or more, uh, more creative I, rewarding? <laughs> I, I, it depends on the, on the, the movie itself, you know? Yeah. Because anything can be... I'm not a great judge of... Uh, um, I, I need to see the thing, you yeah, know, and, and, and sometimes it, it can, I, I don't know if it matters, like, what the, even what the genre is, or yeah. what the, um, whether it's a, a sequel or prequel or whatever, um, it, I think it's all, whatever the movie is, mm -hmm. um, it has to be faithful to itself, and it has to carry you in, uh, along um, and, it, and if it does that then I think um, you know it's easier to be inspired right musically um, is there a certain genre that you or you gravitate towards to whether you're just as a person who likes to view these kind of movies or asshole working in them I mean, you scored almost every genre um, you know action and drama and horror and western I mean is there anything that really just like this is my genre that I love to live in well I sort of approach every movie as a Western. I remember I you, you mentioned that. Yeah. You said, I said, oh, we're talking about Tommy Lee Jones, and we'll, and we'll talk about your work with him. But you're like, yeah, every movie I score is a Western. And I thought that was Yeah, really even Scream. Even Scream, I sort of approached the Western, because 
Yeah, getting back to what I was going to say, the um, so you know besides Fantasia, I think the thing that the the movies that stuck with me most, I I, I don't know, I sort of had a bit of a rocky, you know, uh, youth mm -hmm. period, um, and I just the uh, I just love the Western genre. And, and yeah. Leone is my favorite director. I mean, yeah. especially the, the spaghetti Westerns. Yeah. yeah. I mean like the Sergio Leone movies and, uh, and musically the Morricone scores mm -hmm. just really, I mean, those really resonated with me. Um, just cause they were so original and yeah. in a way simple and, uh, how they used sound, um, sometimes sound is music. Yeah, right. For sure. And um, uh, sort of, again, pushing that timbral boundary, you know, Absolutely. like the reverb of an amp could be a musical yeah. sound, things like that. And, um, and this idea of sort of the lone hero, whatever. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's sort of like a lot of like in Scream, you know, her character is sort of like she's uh, Nev Campbell's character is sort of like the lone hero. And so is, you know, the guy Dewey, you yeah. know, he's like the sheriff, the West sheriff. So um, I, I, I find it um, as an interesting point of departure for for scores that I work on. Right. So, I mean, because, yeah, the, I mean, the archetypes that come with that genre are, I don't know, I, I, I love just characters kind of isolated within like a landscape it doesn't have to be like a western landscape whether it's you know amongst in the woods or something mm -hmm. just like apart from civilization you just feel this kind of isolation yeah and i think that's kind of can characterize a western no matter where it takes place or what yeah, time period right it doesn't mean it's that it's a western but yeah, it's like in it's, the west so the it's an west. abstract notion of absolutely of, uh, yeah and uh, yeah, so let's talk about some of the westerns you score. I mean, Tommy Lee Jones, of course, such an you guys have such an amazing collaboration in the films you've done. I mean, if it, you know, he's of course known for his acting, but Three Burials and and um, Sunset Limited, which is not a western, but I mean, The Homesman. Um, and you guys, I mean, those might be my favorite scores of yours. Like, yeah. I think they're so personal. I don't know, they they just feel so emotional and raw. And I mean, what was like working? I mean, how did you meet him? And and I love working with him. I, yeah. you know, it's um, he has no preconceptions about score he yeah. doesn't use any temp when he's no temp so no that temp. must be such a refreshing and, thing and to come only out embraces originality mm -hmm. and um creativity yeah and uh it's curiosity yeah. i mean he embraces those things and uh how did i get hired on three was it three burials three burials first, right? that was the first one yeah that was his first directing job i think yeah yeah um I don't know. Just a reference. Uh, I don't somehow. know. Yeah. Yeah. But I remember seeing some of the movie and talking to him and thinking about what the score could be. Yeah. Early on, because it's sort of this weird Tex-Mex landscape. Mm hmm You know, on the border, and I was thinking, well, maybe use that sort of the music from that area as a source, but music from that area, I mean, it's like. You know, it's sort of that um, like a lot German of, inspired yeah. polka, and you know, like, yeah. uh, you know, which there were a lot of German settlers there, and, and I think that's why the accordion became like a big right, yeah. instrument for um, Mexican American border area. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was like, you know, we can't do that, and Tommy didn't want that because they they had source music that was going to do that too. Yeah, because they had a lot of needle drops on that one, right? Yeah, yeah. So the thing became all right. Well, maybe search back towards more a more ancient, like um, you know, who was here first? Because mm. the, 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 the landscape plays a big part. In yeah, it. very and, much. Yeah, um, you know, more of a Native American type sound, and use that as the inspiration. Yeah, and. Um, I started messing around with with sounds, taking like cactus needles and you know amplifying them and having them become percussion things. Right. And yeah, I remember you doing, talking, yeah. yeah, doing stuff like that. So um, that uh, that became a big a big score for me. I, I you know me and Buck really yeah. worked on that 
It was a lot of fun. That's a, a lot of fun. Beautiful score. I mean, it's so. And from that, that's what uh, Jim Mangold heard and really liked and hired me for 310 to Yuma. Wow. So yeah. it, it led to a lot of stuff. And then uh, Catherine Bigelow heard that and liked that and, you know, wanted me for Hurt Locker. Her. Wow. Because that was, you know, she viewed the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the guy in the bomb suit as um, sort of like a cowboy. Wow, yeah, so like another Western. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and with, with going back to Tommy Lee Jones and uh, the Sunset Limited, which is such a powerful, uh, based on the play by Cormac McCarthy, and they did an HBO original film out of that, it takes place in one room, um, just Samuel Jackson and Tommy Lee Jones, just, you know, mm -hmm. was it bla black and white was their characters, mm -hmm. I think. And then, I mean, how do you score? It's pretty much a play. I mean, how do you, how, what was music in that sense? Like, what was the role? I, mean, or, I guess minimal role? Or it was, was very it, minimal. He, you know? he, um, he, he wanted the music to be um, sort of the music that, uh, uh, he made, uh, my, my mind is, is going, but, um, there was somebody who made these uh, recordings just sort of walking down the street in the city. Uh -huh. And that became like these musical soundscapes of just... Like city noise? Of city sounds, yeah. you know. And so he thought that would be the approach. Yeah. Rather than using the sound department to sort of create things in the background and all that. I mean, there was some of that. But, yeah. but he wanted the score to integrate that. And so... Um, took train horns and car horns and mm -hmm. started messing a little bit with their tuning and to come up with something that could work thematically. But it's very sparse. There's not that much score. There's a few moments that get yeah. a little more introspective and in the score plays. And then the biggest one was, um, the biggest cue was at the end when, uh, you know, he, he wanted the score to invoke... All religions. That was I right. said. I want this to sort of be like um, uh, the feeling of all different religions coming together. And, yeah. Um, so I messed around again with found sounds and um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And then the homesman, of course, you got to do more experimenting with. I mean, I know you got you talked about a lot. The the was it the wind? It's a wind harp, right? That's what they called yeah. it. Yeah. And just putting that string out there and creating tones from. Uh, well, that. Buck started doing some experiments on the thing because it was so desolate with uh, yeah. putting bottles outside with um, when the Santa Ana winds would blow and putting microphones in the bottles and capturing that mm. and wow. using that. And so we did a little bit on the thing, but then he started putting these like little Aeolian harps in, in the window mm -hmm. and they would, uh, when the wind came through, they would, you could tune them and all that. Yeah. And then... He read about some guy that did these, I think in New Mexico, um, uh, like take the piano and extend the piano wires. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, we should try that. And I was like, yeah, all right, let's try that. <laughs> <laughs> so so we found a piano and just messed around with it. Yeah, put it up you just did it hill. up on the hill right over here. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the strings go, you know, 175 feet up the hill. Wow. And so, I mean, I love the theme, the kind of the central theme of the homes. And where did, where did that, the dun, 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 I mean, where did that kind of, what was that born from, I guess, for that film? Um, well, it was inspired by the simple hymnal type melodies that, yeah. um, that, that they would sing. There was, uh, there was some source pieces that, um, Rosalie, the prairie flower, and some other things that, uh, uh, Tommy pointed me to that he liked and mm -hmm. so I thought maybe uh, a simple melody along those lines because um, it does feel like there there's lyrics there somewhere for that for that melody um, are there no no okay no. No. <laughs> so you're able no. to write like a, I guess a lyrical type yeah so it's just like a yeah a very simple <laughs> yeah. lyrical piece like like something they may have sung or whatever I, yeah um, uh, we wanted to make sure there were no issues with copyright. Yeah, to make it original, of course. Make it original. I mean, if, and it, a way yeah. you break it down, I mean, it can be 
desolate it can be powerful and then at the end when you know music is coming to town was the track and it's just it's an emotional swell i mean i love it. it's i really love the score yeah that was a lot of fun that was <laughs> and one thing that we did on that was um you know i built the studio and it sounds great and all that but um it was a little too warm so hmm. we we even experimented we put the the orchestra outside yeah that's right i saw that video guys I oh yeah said, yeah and you guys recorded the orchestra out, outside yeah. right wow yeah, i mean just, <laughs> you know you have a lot of ambient noises you have to deal with yeah dogs and ducks and planes planes and, yeah um so took a few takes but it was it was definitely cool wow i mean yeah it's such an amazing score um and you also of course mentioned james mangold with return to yuma and and um of course the wolverine and and, and logan I guess they're all again westerns, and um, mm -hmm. what, what, I mean, what kind of director is, is James? I mean, is he tuned into music? I mean, working yeah. with him now, like, I mean, was it you guys created? I think a language, I think, between the both of you over the course of those films, for sure. Yeah, he's extremely musical. He's very knowledgeable about film scores, and um, and again, I, I think the, the the reason collaboration is so good is that um, he really embraces. Uh, same same thing yeah. originality creativity um, I mean he, he works with um, Ted Kaplan who's a, an amazing music editor mm -hmm. who, who does temp stuff and he temps so well that I'm like shit I'm never going to be able to beat this <laughs> but <laughs> um, but um, it, it's uh, it, it it's really it's really refreshing to, you know yeah. to work with someone like that um, he pointed me in the beginning to things that wouldn't necessarily work for his movie, but things that were inspiring to him mm -hmm. and sort of um, were in the back of his mind when he was making the movie. And, right. and that's, a, that's a great source to um, for a composer because you're working with an idea rather than a specific thing you know yeah not like copy this music like this is just right that, where the music should come from is from this idea yeah yeah and so um we actually did some sessions uh before we recorded just to play around with this stuff yeah and um i think fox thought we were nuts because they were <laughs> crazy sessions um they walked in and they walked out real fast um this is for logan or yeah for, for yeah. logan <laughs> Um, but, but I, I think it, it, uh, it, it makes the process that much more interesting and yeah. fun and you have the uh, potential to come up with something cool. Right. Well, Logan was interesting because he went with Cliff Martinez first, like, right? He wanted to get, he decided, oh, I'm going to do something different. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, came running back to you. Uh, well, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I guess, you know, it, it shows how, um, a movie can sort of, on paper, it's one thing, you yeah, know, and, yeah. and can be deceiving too to to just read a script. But it's such a visual medium. Right. Like sometimes the movie takes on its own life after a shot. Yeah. And, um, and you sort of have to just be, go, go be, with the flow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just funny just how it's like, oh, let's try something different. No, we got to go. I mean, I, I love you guys' collaboration. I hope you guys continue powering through together. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I love him. Yeah, they're amazing director. I mean, those are all some of my, like, I mean, Logan was amazing, but Three Kind of Yuma was just fantastic. I think it's just a great modern take on the Western and just yeah. feels classical, but it feels modern for sure. Um, so, and, uh, of course, another director, Alex Proyas, which is fantastic with iRobot mm -hmm. and Knowing and Gods of Egypt. Um, with him, I mean, uh, approaching, I mean, do you have to, like, I guess... You have all these different directors that you work with, and you've created all these collaborative relationships. Um, do you have to kind of adapt your personality and workflow for each one? I mean, they all work differently. Does it? Or, I mean, do you have to kind of be a therapist, I guess, to kind of work with every single one to make sure they're. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a little. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it's a very dynamic job in that sense. Yeah. Like each each film is completely different as different as the people shooting them you yeah, know as yeah. as different as one director is from another um and uh yeah i i guess being able to adapt and have the language 
to communicate ideas um, is different with everybody. Yeah. Uh, so I and and it gets easier. I think the more you work with somebody, because you almost develop a a shorthand of what yeah. things are. Does it get harder to get away with things? <laughs> like because they know you better than like oh I know you I know you Marco you can't do that shit on this. You, like does it get does it get harder to I don't know but does it um, does they know you more? Is it? <laughs> that's that's interesting. No, I mean. <laughs> I, I think it gets um, it gets easier because I, yeah. I find that there's more trust involved. For sure. There's more, um, all right, you know, we don't even need to tempt this scene because we know you're going to come up with something. Yeah. Uh, so just take it like this. I don't need to show you right. how, how, how to play it. Um, uh, Alex, he's super creative, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, he's, he's it, visually as well. I mean, he's just an amazing visual director. And yeah. And I yeah. Robot was, I mean, a, a lot of that's just people love the film, love the score. Yeah. Yeah. He's so, he's almost like too advanced for his time. Like he's yeah. doing things. He was working on um, Paradise Lost, uh, yeah. the Milton thing, uh, which was, uh, all they got was previs on it. And then there wasn't any technology yet to film, to film it. They wow. had to like, you know, it was like um, so far pushing the envelope. Yeah. Um, and and musically, you know, he has he has uh, a lot of he has vision and also trust in in a collaborative vision. You know, working together right. and coming and up with stuff. He's in Australia, right? Yeah. So you have to do you have to you have to fly out there when you work on one of his films. Yeah, I usually go meet him and uh, a couple of times. On the but you, do you just come back here to work, or do you like kind of relocate there and kind of no, work close I, to his I, production? I work here. I yeah. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so kind of the, some newer stuff that you, you've done, I mean, you did uh, on Netflix right now, Little Evil, which is oh, kind of a horror comedy take. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always, I think horror and comedy are two genres that are so difficult on their own to score. I mean, what, how, was it a challenge to find the tone, the right tone musically for, for something like that? Uh, not for most of it. Most of it was pretty... Straightforward. S straightforward. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how there do you was play, a couple. Yeah. How do you do? You play it for the funny, or do you play it just for the horror and let the comic, the actors, yeah. kind of do the comedy? Usually. Yeah. yeah usually. Okay. Uh, there was um, a couple scenes that were a little trickier that um, needed a little bit of finesse because it, if you played it as a like the beginning of the movie when um, you know she's. Uh, um, I don't know, cleaning the house or whatever, and the, yeah. the, the, the moving trucks there and moving the stuff. Uh, it um, that was a that was a bit of a tricky scene. Yeah, to play how to play that because you know just beginning the movie you sort of want to set it up. You don't want to have a one off the cue that's right. completely different from everything else. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, it was pretty straightforward. Was it different working on a, a film that was a Netflix production? I know Netflix is kind of just taking the surge as you know, original films and really trying to put focus back on the directors and the creators. I mean, did you feel a difference working versus like a, a big studio picture versus Netflix? Was there less the, studio involvement? The only thing I found, because there was, I, that was actually the, the second Netflix one. Oh, right. Um, uh, that there, I didn't, there was no like studio involvement. Like, yeah. uh, Uh, like I was used to, you know, we have studio executives coming over and, you know, putting their input. Mm -hmm. I, maybe they had that on their end. Maybe they had to share the stuff. I don't know. But right. uh, for me, it was just working with the director. So in that wow. sense, it's good. Yeah. I mean, what's your what's your take on Netflix and kind of taking stream, stream, taking streaming, like bringing, I guess, uh, get criticism for, I guess, ruining the theatrical experience where they like, oh, we're premiering movies in your home versus in theaters. I mean, do you have a take on that or <laughs> um i i mean it it uh if if that's what the if that's what people want i mean obviously that's they're making money yeah. it, so um uh i prefer to see a movie in the theater yeah uh, but then on the other hand i don't 
have a lot of time to get to the theater. <laughs> so I end up watching most movies at home. At home, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, now with 4K and surround sound, it's pretty. You can get a close replication yeah. of what the theatrical experience is. I mean, I love Netflix for. Uh, yeah, for I mean, they're really I think focusing on creativity and and so many different things. Every Netflix, there's no like brand of Netflix. Like the originals are so varied. So I think it's really cool that there's a lot of new ideas I think coming up. From yeah, that. yeah. Now, um, for for the spirit of developing original voice, I think it's good. Yeah, absolutely. So again, of course, your most recent film, uh, first they killed my father, um, a daughter of uh, Cambodia remembers, which is a very powerful film. Again, with uh, Netflix, yeah, comes yeah. up on Netflix, and with working with Angelina Jolie. Um, so when you approach this film, you know it's a very kind of serious subject matter, um, and Angelina has you know a wealth of information as a storyteller and, and, and talents and really trying to create something that has an impact. Uh, what was kind of the approach that you wanted with the score and, and I guess what was your envi envisioning the goal for the music of this film? Well, her vision was that it, uh, the music should be, or the whole film should be the experience of um, the, uh, through the eyes of this six-year-old girl. Mm. Meaning that um, the 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 music is not it's not for the audience to say oh we're you know um, here we are in Cambodia yeah. or whatever it's it's more like more visceral this girl's reaction it's much more um, it's not a melodic score mm -hmm. in many respects it's not a harmonic score it's more of like um, I did have a few strings, but pretty much the thing was an electronic score. It was like um, more um, sonic manipulations, working with sound, working with... Um, uh, was it hard to get into that, I guess, into her POV the, as a six-year-old girl? My, my inner six-year-old yeah. girl. Um, it, it was challenging in that regard. Right. Yeah, I mean... Uh, Less is really more really delicate, really delicate in terms of um, how much to say and how to say it and how dark things are and yeah. how things are like color a scene so quickly mm -hmm. like you can make things you know it could be really bad things happening. Um, from a six-year-old's point of view, it might not be understood in the right. same way. So trying to trying to capture that feel um, that emotional sense of um, someone that's young and not quite sure of what it is that's going on around them. Right. Um, that, that, yeah, it was it was tricky in that sense. And uh, and Angelina, of course, you know, of course, she's known for her, her acting, and um, you've worked with Tommy Lee Jones, who's also kind of an actor and director. Do you, do you find a difference between directors who come from an acting background? Is there like a certain, do they work differently? Are they more tuned to the performance? Or I mean, is there, or are they just there to tell the story? No, no I think they are more tuned to the performance. Yeah. yeah. And, and how, and how music really colors it very easily. Mm. I think more so. I think they're more attuned to that. Um, because Tommy was, you know, very attuned to that as well. Yeah, I mean, those are two veteran actors, and yeah, <laughs> yeah, so which is interesting. Which it, it, it's, um, I, I mean, sometimes we would have to discuss this stuff because yeah. I, I, I sometimes I almost thought it was too close to some things and too sensitive, like you know, um. Like being an, an actor and understanding the the process is is different than like the average person watching a movie right. who's not aware of these things. And yeah. So. Um, uh, so yeah, it's it it definitely. Uh, and I'm sure they. I think they. I feel like they would communicate better about getting into. I guess the internal. Like emotional internal emotions of the character because I think, in the end, your job is almost becoming. A psychologist, where you have to analyze a character and find out 
you know, figuratively crack open their head and, and what are they feeling? And then Yeah, well, yeah, but the thing is, yeah, and that's the interesting thing because you have to be able to do that on a character level. Yeah. But then also on a global scale, you know, and how does that, you can't get caught up in the minutia, but you know, right, I, I mean, okay, you have yeah. to be aware of that, but you have to also keep in mind um, the whole picture itself. Right. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I, th I think, you know, I, for the most part, I probably wrote, overwrote in the beginning and stripped mm -hmm. back ideas right. as things went on. And, you know, um, it's delicate too because you don't want it to turn into like, you know. Um, it can become melodramatic too if you get too much music in it there. Could, it could yeah. be melodramatic or, you know, it could run the risk of, if you start adding some ethnic things, yeah. you know, it turns into like massage music or something, yeah. you know? Yeah, just so. like that was very easy to uh, Cambodia, boom, just put that right. there, yeah. Um, so there, there was kind of going against that, not trying to make it, make the score for the audiences, I guess, you know, like, uh, tell the audience where you are, tell the, just kind of keeping it personal for mm -hmm. the character. Yeah. yeah. Um, to kind of talk about process a little bit, um, and I'm sure this is going to differ from film to film, but for you, where does the first note usually come from? I mean, where do you, what do you like to do when you take on a project? Do you like to speak to the director first? Do you, if there's a cut, do you like to watch that cut kind of whole first? Do you like to, I mean... Uh, I usually like to watch it by myself yeah. first and get a sense um, before I talk to him. I mean, maybe the director will say something ahead of time, mm -hmm. whatever, this is, you know these are some issues that we have with it or whatever. Right. Um, but for the most part, uh, I like to get an emotional wash over me of what, like, what it is that I'm seeing and right. how, how that transfers musically and um, trying to boil it down to... Do you gravitate towards, the, like, the characters? Well, the whatever. I mean, yeah. something, but, like, something that's sort of the essence mm -hmm. of the picture from which everything will... Blossom, like, you know, yeah. like almost like an acorn from which the tree grows, right. and and what that happens to be, and if, whether it's a sound or whether it's a, a, a simple melody or a fragment of a melody or um, a harmony or instrument, right? You know, and um, if you're brought on early, though, do you ever try to? tamper with ideas based off the script or will you just wait till there's a I've made step? that mistake I, I think it's a, a, I've never been I've never been um, accurate like yeah. reading a script and then finding and then uh, it, it, it totally skews it hmm. and and then it actually becomes harder because then you're you, you're thinking about the music you already have an emotional attachment that you put with a script that yeah. you associate with the movie Right, and, yeah. And then the movie itself. So it's. I think it's way better to wait until you actually have the visuals. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, when, if I'm writing a screenplay or, or trying to come up with an idea, I'll listen to music, and, and music usually is where the ideas come from. For me, you know, kind of sparking visuals. Um, but then for you, the music will come from the visual, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, I don't know, like the chicken and the egg, like yeah, <laughs> what, which, which what's inspiring, first? who's inspiring yeah. who here? Because um, I, yeah. I know a lot of writers, and that's what te where temp comes from, because temp it pushes the vision, and mm -hmm. they have to have music, and if they don't have it, they'll grab something else and mm -hmm. stick it in there and make it work. It's almost like you know, when I was doing student films and just like, oh, my favorite CDs I'm putting in there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. an, it's interesting. I mean, I just, it just, it's just interesting how vision or visuals are born from music and then music are born from Yeah, visuals. so they feed each other. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, so for, for you, what's the most rewarding part of this job? Like, is there a favorite, is it the, the final product, uh, the initial workings? I oh, think, uh, I mean, I sort of view each project as a puzzle. Yeah, you know, and um, there can be a lot of searching, and it can be that's the hardest part, I think, because you until you have something, you have nothing. Yeah, right? um, is that scary to have just and, the blank page in front of you. It is like or going down directions that don't work or whatever, and you know right. they don't work. And um, I think for me the. the Cracking the puzzle of the picture mm -hmm. is the most rewarding part. That and um, 
actual scoring. Yeah. You know, if it's with a orchestra or even creating cues here or whatever, but uh, I the the first the beginning, you know, solving the puzzle yeah. and then um, and then actually working with musicians and creating music, yeah. you know, from from something flat becomes three dimensional. Yeah, I mean that's it's that, amazing work. It just comes from our heads. It's crazy. Like it's yeah. just all born from ideas, and then we make it into something. I think it's yeah something special about film for me. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that that's I think the, the most rewarding part. Um, I think the the least rewarding is. You know, in every film, there's cues that are derivative from things or whatever, and sort of like when you know what it needs to be, and you have to fill in the blanks. Yeah. So when the I guess the, the industry part of it seeps in, and <laughs> the business yeah. side of it, and making sure it sounds like this, or <laughs> yeah. Um, if you could uh, have a position, another job on on the film set, whether it's in front of the camera, behind the camera, if you could pick any one, that would have been your career. What would you have? What would you choose, <laughs> hypothetically? Like, is there any other um, set designer or probably writer? I mean, writer, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, because again, it's, it's like creation of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, Do you write at all on the side, just not music, or no, no? I mean, when I was younger, I did, yeah, not for film, but uh, but yeah, I think it's a similar process of uh, synthesizing. Mm -hmm some sort of universe from, yeah. from you know just nothing. different different language words yeah. and music yeah yeah <laughs> translates pretty easily um i do want to talk about how a kind of I, I love your studio for how unique it is and of course the location is there re the reason is there a reason that you decided to kind of um build the studio here i mean you're kind of high up in the hills here kind of overlooking the pacific ocean i mean is there is it's isolation remoteness kind of trans come from the is this more creative to be out here than kind of closer to the studios and stuff like that um <laughs> <laughs> or is it just you just well, like the area <laughs> I, I i like the area the um i wanted to have enough space to yeah to, to the whole i mean it's 20 acres uh to have um and there's no you're not on top of anybody so right be able to do things record outside we do all kinds of experiments and um you know setting up speakers outside and and whatever it's like yeah. a playground yeah it's a big playground and not be disturbing anybody number one yeah not hearing about complaints not um uh being interfered with i mean yeah when we recorded outside we had some noises but really yeah. it wasn't bad we were yeah, able it's... to do it which is amazing um and um and plus i love I don't know. I go. I hike a lot, and yeah, I, it's beautiful it, terrain. It's, it, it's sort of like the last refuge up here. I feel like of Malibu. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, it is a little out of the way. Sometimes it comes in handy. Oh, for you know, sure. you, in order for <laughs> you know the studio to come hear stuff, whatever they get it. them away a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> they got to make an appointment. You, you know, check the check the traffic. Oh, drop we'll out. come back next week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. I would just love it to be able, I'm mean, sure, and so probably also, really, I haven't been here at night, but like, it must be so quiet at night just to be able to just step out and to clear your head. I it is. Know. I mean, the star, you can see stars like you can't in, in town. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, you're really aware of the wildlife around you yeah. and everything. It's, it's, yeah, it's definitely, I've, 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 out of all computer studios, don't think that is my favorite. <laughs> um, so kind of looking f forward, do you, do you, I mean, you've established such an amazing career for yourself. At this point in your career, do you create personal goals, like, like a five-year plan at this point? I mean, do you have like a, are you just kind of living life one day at a time, whatever well, project I, comes? I'm working on a project that doesn't have to do with film yeah, right just, now. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, uh, it, it's, it's. A little tough going because it takes time. Yeah, and uh, we're you know we keep getting distractions. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean we keep working on projects. But right. um, you know it's a long term thing. It's just kind of like a concert piece or yeah, like um, a bunch of different um, 
concert pieces, yeah. I guess. Wow. Well, that'll be... I know, because I, know, I think John Powell completed one, and I want to talk to him. He has ideas, yeah, but it's just... It's always here, and then the projects yeah, keep coming, the so it stuff, distracts yeah. and... It gets sidetracked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and the thing, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be vague about it, but it, it's sort of like I'm not sure what the shape of it. Yeah. You know, the whole thing is yet. And, uh, yeah, for sure. You know, I've written um, maybe about half a dozen things that they that I'm still working on, you know, like yeah. it's like still in progress. Well, uh, Mark, I just wanted to, you know, I'm out of questions for now, but I just wanted to thank you so much for walking through your career and then talking about your recent projects and, and, and picking your brain about your process. It's been uh, a lot of fun. Thank you so much for oh, your time today. Sure. Thank you. <laughs>